During today's class, if you have any questions, uh, we're going to be in a screen sharing mode. So you're going to see a little menu up at the top of the screen that you can click on that will have a drop down that there will be a little chat dialogue in there that you can click on and uh, type in any questions. I'll also pause periodically to allow you to go in uh, just, to, just to make sure everybody's keeping up and, and going on. Also, uh, at the end of the class, I have a basically an outline of what we've gone over today and as far as uh, steps to go through for doing your color correction, uh, your image corrections, those type of thing in Camera Raw. And I will put that up so you guys can download that as well. Give me just a couple seconds here to finish some setup and we're going to get started. Okay, let's jump over into our screen sharing mode. So you should see now a little green um, menu up at the top center of your screen. And if you click on that, you'll be able to bring out uh, or see the chat dialog that will come down that you can type into. And I'll have that open up on my screen so I can see if you have any questions. And if you're having any problems during the class with audio or anything like that, let me know. And I'll do what I can during the class to try to help fix those problems, which sometimes can be a little bit difficult as, as the class is going on to do simultaneously. So last week we had Adobe Camera Raw, revisiting Adobe Camera Raw part one, and we spent a good portion of the class talking about Adobe Bridge, how to use that in the raw workflow. Uh, we went over um, how to set up Bridge, how to do a lot of different things in that. And the reason I, I spent about an hour on that last week is it is really the key to being efficient in Adobe Camera Raw as far as your workflow. We're not going to spend as much time today actually working through Bridge, but we're going to still use Bridge to access the Adobe Camera Raw plugin. And that's one of the things to mention is uh, the, when you go in and process a RAW file, the interface that you're in is actually a plugin that can be hosted inside of Bridge or inside of Photoshop. And one of the reasons that, that I host it within Bridge or, or don't even have Photoshop opening is for memory requirements. With, if I open a bunch of images up into Bridge, say this folder I'm in right now, if we zoom it down so we can see all the thumbnails in there, there's about 120 thumbnails in there. Now I could in a workflow select all of those and open them up into Camera Raw in Bridge or Photoshop, but it's not the most efficient way. If I'm dealing with a wedding, for example, I'm limited to only being able to open about 200 images at a time into Photoshop. If I'm dealing in Adobe Bridge, I can, I'm limited only by the amount of memory I have on my computer. So that's one of the reasons I host within Bridge whenever possible. Another reason is I can actually, if I've got a, a good computer that's got a lot of memory and a lot of horsepower in it, I can actually have Adobe Bridge processing out raw files on one end and then going into Photoshop and retouching simultaneously. So I can actually almost two, kill two birds with one stone and get some productivity going on there. So that's, again, another reason that I host within Adobe Bridge. So we've just had some people join us and just going to comment to all of them that uh, there is a green menu bar up at the top of your screen. And you can click on that, and it will drop down and allow you to get to a chat dialog. So if you have any questions, feel free to chat those to me as we're going, and I'll do my best to answer those. So we've talked a little bit why we're going to host in Bridge. Let's go in and look at some quick preferences that we did not set up last week or we did not talk about. And if you're on a Mac, you come under Adobe Bridge into Camera Raw Preferences. If you're on a PC, it will be under Edit. Camera Raw preferences. I'm also going to comment that I'm using um, Adobe Bridge CS5 with the latest updates on that. So uh, if, if you're on an earlier version of Bridge, many of the things that I'm going to show you today uh, are going to carry over and work exactly the same. Uh, so there's very little differences between them. Um, there's some functionality difference, but the main ideas are going to carry over. 
Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, also, double check when you open Camera Raw what version you're running and make sure you're on the most current version. One of the most common tech support phone calls or emails that I get is, I just got a new camera and I can't see my raw files inside of Bridge. Usually that's because you're not on the most current version of the camera raw plugin, especially if it's a brand new camera. Um, that plugin might not be updated yet. Adobe does a real good job of updating those quickly, uh, but that's, that's a common occurrence and, and sometimes there's some workarounds you have to do to get things working correctly that first time. So that's just something to keep in mind if you come in and you don't actually see images for your thumbnails. First thing to always check is what version of Camera Raw are you running and are you on the most current version. Okay, so in the preferences, some of the things that we can look at is, uh, for example, saving image settings. And my preference is to put those into an XMP file. And what is that? Well, we'll talk about XMP files in just a little bit so you can see what they are and how they work. Um, I also apply sharpening to all the images. I know some people that do preview only, but I like uh, applying the sharpening to everything. I have some default image settings, which are, are things that are going to apply to everything. There's an uh, apply auto tone adjustments, and that basically just looks at every image and automatically applies a correction to it. I'm not real comfortable doing that. I find that I, I want to see how it was captured. Uh, I've seen in, in certain situations where I'll go through and bracket a series of images that applying that auto tone adjustments, I really can't see what I've done. It, it, it negates all of that. I do apply an auto grayscale mix uh, when I'm converting to grayscale, which is it does a nice job, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. more. I can make specifics, make defaults, which means when I set up some defaults, I can make them specific to a camera serial number, and I can also make them specific to a camera ISO setting. Where this comes in handy, uh, default specific to a camera serial number, if I have uh, photographing two different cameras simultaneously, and I find that one camera tends to be, has a little different color balance when I do a custom white balance on it, I can uh, make preferences to, to handle that. So, I don't have to go and correct that camera differently than the second camera. I could also use that to say, this camera serial number, whenever you see images from it, convert them to black and white. Uh, there's a lot of things that, as you start thinking about your workflow, that that might come into play. I can also make default specific to camera ISO settings. Where that comes into play is if I know that a specific ISO on my camera needs a different amount of sharpening, a different amount of noise reduction, I can modify that and make that a default specific to that, that ISO setting, which is one of the things that I like to do. There is a camera raw cache. That's basically where it stores all the camera raw data, thumbnails about your raw images and things like that. Periodically, it's a good idea to empty that out. If camera raw and bridge starts acting a little wonky, that's a technical term, basically acting a little strange, it's, that's one of the things that I'll go through and do is purge that cache. Now, what that's doing, it's not throwing away any corrections I've done to the images. All it's doing is throwing away the thumbnail that Adobe Bridge has built based on the file and the XMP data. So it's a good idea to, if you're having problems to clear that out. You can also specify where you want to store that, and I'm just going with the default location right now. DNG files, we talk about if you're going to use a DNG file, there's some information here. Right now, I'm not using DNG files in my workflow. Um, it's something that I'm looking at and, and determining how, if I'm going to implement it, how I'm going to implement it and go about that. Um, and there's a lot of information on DNG files out online. So it's something that if you're, if you're interested in that, um, do, you can contact me and I can point you in some directions on on research, and we can talk about pros and cons on that. Now, down below, uh, JPEG and TIFF handling, um, this allows me, it, it, I can use the Adobe RAW Converter to work and batch convert JPEG and TIFF files. Keep in mind that I'm not converting in a 16-bit mode, and so I don't, I can't make as large of an adjustment if I'm adjusting that JPEG or TIFF. 
Um, it is very handy to be able to use that because you can batch crop, you can do small color and density adjustments, and it's a real good way to make some, some tweaks in your workflow. So kind of keep that in mind what those are. Some people will disable that JPEG and TIFF support. Um, it just depends on what your workflow is. Personally, I, I go ahead and have that in there for a couple reasons. One, for tech support for customers. B, I do, uh, on occasion, use Adobe Bridge and Camera Raw to adjust my JPEG files. Okay, that's a quick <laughs> overview of the preferences. And last week, also in our class, we spent quite a bit of time going through just the bridge preferences, setting those up, and going through all the things here. So um, please visit that class online and check that out. Okay, when I'm working on images in Bridge, the first thing that I do typically is go through and look at um, the group of images just to see uh, do I have images that are similar um, that I can correct together? Are things scattered around? So in my workflow, um, if I'm a wedding photographer, I know a lot of times wedding photographers like to arrange the images to tell a specific story. I don't do that as the first part of my workflow because I may lose my ability to do quick and efficient batch corrections. So to do that, I want to keep the images in the sequence that they were captured so that I have images that were shot in the same conditions grouped together. So when I go through this and look at this folder, I can see, starting with this very first image, I've got about um, 15 images that were shot in a very similar location. There are some differences uh, coming across some of those, but overall they're pretty pretty similar. As I scroll down through this, I can see that I have images that are grouped together. Um, I can see I've got bunches that I can correct at the same time. So I, it's very obvious here that I can go from this uh, Adobe brick uh, stucco wall to a designer wall, and those can be corrected the same. Then we jump out into this grass area, and so on and so forth going through here. Another thing, this is from one of our customers out in Denver, some sample images they sent me. And one of the things that they did was really good is every time they moved to a new location or a new scene, they photographed this little uh, target. It's a gray target. This one's, I believe, by, from Last Light. And it's a real good target to use for color correction. You can also use it to get some basics on exposure. But you'll see as we go through these, every time they move to a new location, they throw that target in there. Why do they do that? Well, one, uh, in my workflow when I'm shooting raw, one of the things that I, that I show and that I teach is just set your camera to daylight. Leave it on one white balance setting and don't worry about changing it. Then when you get into camera raw and you find, uh, when you look at your images, it helps you identify which images can be corrected together and then by having that gray card in there, I can grab a whole bunch of images and within three clicks do a, a custom white balance across all those images in Camera Raw. And it's one less thing that I have to worry about when I'm behind the camera. So let's start off with and talk about the tools in Camera Raw. So I'm just going to select this group of images to correct and talk about those tools at the same time. To open these images up into Camera Raw, I can do this a couple different ways. One, I can come under File and open in Camera Raw, or I can use the shortcut key, which is Command-R on a Mac or Control-R on a PC. So I'm going to go ahead and open those up into Camera Raw. Now, the first time this opens up into Camera Raw, it's going to be a smaller inset window like you're seeing right here. So I can leave it at this size or I can make it fill the screen. It's just whatever your preference is and how much screen real estate you have. For me, I like to make it as large as possible to fill the screen. To do that, I just press this little icon here or press the shortcut key F to toggle into full screen mode. You'll notice something else to point out when I'm not in full screen mode. I can see the camera raw version that I'm running, and I also see the model of camera that I'm using. So that may be some information that you might need if you're trying to troubleshoot or uh, talking with someone as far as, well, my sliders look like this. How come you don't have the same options? And that's a, a good place you can see that information. Okay. 
So let's start talking through the Camera Raw dialog and what we have in here. I'm going to start with these tools coming across the top, uh, top side. The first thing is the zoom tool. We can click on that to zoom in. If we hold down our Alt or Option key, it'll let us zoom back out. We can also change the magnification by coming down here to the bottom of the screen, and we can. there's a plus and minus down there. We can also jump to a specific, like I want to see it at 100%, or I want to make sure it fits into the view. I can use the same shortcut keys that I have in Photoshop, Control, Command, Plus, or Minus, to zoom up and down on the image as well. Now the next thing that I can do, you can see there's a hand tool. If I click on that, it lets me click and drag to move the image around in the, in the screen. And just like in Photoshop, I can also go and use the space bar. I very rarely use these first two tools because I often use my shortcut keys, Control, Command, plus or minus, and the space bar just to move my image around. So they're up there if you want to use them. For me and my workflow, I very rarely touch them. Okay, our next tool here is our white balance tool. And let me zoom back out to fill the screen. When I select that tool and click on a part of my image, it's going to say make that tone neutral. So for example, I just clicked on the gray target for the uh, zebra car or for the white balance. When I click on that, it neutralizes it. If I click up here on the skin tone, you can see it tries to make that go to a neutral tone, and I get uh, a very different color shift. If I come over here and click on the green area, it's going to make everything go to a magenta. And as I'm clicking around, if you watch over here on the right side of the screen, you'll see the temperature and tint sliders move as well. And that's just letting you know that's the type of adjustment that would have to be made to make that specific area go to a neutral tone. So I don't really worry about what those numbers are um, as long as I've clicked on something neutral. Okay, our next tool over is our color sampler tool. If we use this tool and click around on our image, it's going to add a color sampler point. So in this case, you'll see up here in the top portion of our screen, it gives us a RGB value for red, green, and blue. So that spot on her nose right there is giving me an RGB value. I can also click that on the gray, and I see when I do that, those grays are fairly neutral, meaning the red, green, and blue numbers are almost equal. It's off by a, a, a value of two, which is, is basically negligible. So I can click around and grab different points on my image and see how those read across the screen. I can add up to nine points. After I click to go to the tenth one, I will get this dialog that says, hey, what, you've added too many, you can't go more than that. So I can see now that I've got ten different or nine different points on this screen that I can read those values across the top. In all honesty, I probably never place more than two or three coming across an image, but there are times when you might want to use as many as nine. Now to get rid of those, I can do this one of two ways. One, if I hold down my Alt Option key and hover over one of those points, you'll see that tool changes to a little pair of scissors, and that just snips off that one point. So I could go through and get rid of one point at a time. Another way that I could get rid of those is click on a point and just drag it off the, to the edge of the screen. Well, it used to be you could drag them off, but not any longer. The third way is just press this clear samples, and that gets rid of all of them. So if you need to get rid of just specifically one, use your Alt Option key and click on it. If you need to get rid of all of them, just press the clear samples. And we'll talk about how to use that tool a little bit more as we progress. Our next is our targeted adjustment tool. That allows us to come in and click, and based on uh, either curves, hue, saturation, luminance, or a grayscale mix, adjust the image. So if I click and drag on this black port or per sweater, it adjusts the curve for that specific area. So you see that jumped us over to our tone curve. So I can come in and just lighten up the blacks. Or I can come up here on the background and take and tone down 
maybe some of that highlight area, and we see how that adjusts the curve here. Now, something that I just did that's really handy, anytime you make an adjustment in Camera Raw, so for example, I grabbed this slider, the shadow slider over on the right side. To set that back to a default, just double click on it and it will take it back to the default location. So under that targeted adjustment, we can come in and also adjust saturation or brightness or go to a grayscale. And as we change to different one operations here, it will change us to the appropriate tool over here. So I went to specifically the saturation. And so when I click on that green background area, you can see it's pulling the yellow green slider and I'm either desaturating it or I'm increasing the saturation on it. So if you're not sure how to make an adjustment or what areas it needs to be adjusted as far as tones or things like that, that targeted adjustment tool is a great way to come in and learn what, what colors are going to be adjusted as you go through there. Okay, our next tool over is our crop tool. If you click and hold down on this, you can see you can crop to different aspect ratios. And go to a square, I can go to a 4 by 5 or 8 by 10 ratio. I can even put in my own custom ratios. So on customs, for example, I can cut crop by ratio, by a pixel size, by inches, or by centimeters. And in more advanced workflows, there's a lot of ways to fine tune this to get, get very specific results. I often just crop by ratio and will type in the ratio that I'm looking for. If I'm not sure what the ratio is, then I'll come in and maybe type in inches. So let's say I'm trying to go to a long, a 10 by 30. So now as I drag my crop, we see I get a real long 10 by 30 or 1 to 3 crop. The other thing that's handy to know is I don't have to type it in for horizontal and vertical. I can just drag my crop either direction. And so I'm just dragging it more to the side now, so I'm getting a horizontal dragging straight down and I get more of a vertical crop. You'll also notice on this crop that I am seeing some guidelines. It's showing me a rule of third guides. I can come in and turn that overlay on or off and have some different options there. So right now it saved my crop as a 10 by 30. If I want to revert back to a 4 by 5, just click on that and I'm now in a 4 by 5 crop on that image. So I can go through those very easily. I can also come in and just clear the crop. And if I change my crop to normal, it gives me a free, free aspect ratio crop. So I'm not constrained by specific like 8 by 10 size. If I want a crop just to get you know, a very artistic look and I'm not worried about what the actual canvas size is, I can do that with, with the normal setting. Okay, we're going to come back and talk about the crop tool a little bit more as we're doing batch corrections. Our next icon over is to rotate or a lot or straighten our tool. So if I have an image that I know, for example, that this is supposed to be a horizontal line, I can just select that tool, click and drag, and it's going to rotate the crop so that it's now horizontal. So we can see that li that lines up pretty close with the bottom of the crop. So I can come in and position however I want that crop to be. Uh, this is great if you're doing a group shot on an altar with a wedding and you want to get the stairs perfectly level. It's a great way to come in and do use that align tool. Once again, that can be batch applied across a bunch of images. Our next icon over is the spot removal. We have a red eye removal tools, and these can do uh, some real nice basic retouching enhancements. So for example, if I zoom up on my image, and let's say I had a piece of camera dirt, so I've got this white spot here, it lets me click and drag to say how big the circle is, where it's coming, and then the green spot says where it's going to come from to clone in. So I'll do another one over here. Let's say I want to get rid of this white line. I can select that red target drag that out far enough, and if I go through and do a couple of those, coming across, as I work across there, I could use that for some just very basic blemish retouching. I can 
have an overlay tool so I can turn that on or off. You can see I didn't do a really great job, but it did clean that line off. I can specify whether it does heal or clone, and those will determine whether it's going to bring the texture over or texture and color. So I often just have it set to the heal option. I can also come back and just press clear all to take all those points off. So this can be really handy for getting rid of camera dirt if you're photographing high key to get some scratches off the background, uh, things like that. Our next icon over is our red eye removal. I don't have any red eye in this image, but what you'll do with this is just come in and select the eye, and it's going to look to say, hey, wait, I see the red eye in there. Let me take care of that. And it does a, a really nice job of cleaning that out. Um, so on a on snapshot or an event where you have a, an on-camera flash that doesn't have enough dif distance between the flash and the lens, it's a great tool to come in and fix red eye very quickly. Our next tool over is our adjustment brush, and we're going to talk about that more later on along with the graduated filter. They're kind of an advanced tool that um, I do use frequently, but I don't use it in the, in the bulk part of my raw processing. Our next icon over brings over our camera raw preferences, which we've talked about. I can rotate an image left or right up here if I need to. I can also indicate if I want to delete an image or reject it, and that throws it into the trash. I can also uh, undelete them by just clicking on it a second time, and it will bring it back. So that basically goes through the tools right here. I spend a lot of my time using the white balance tool and the crop tool and I spend, secondly, time using these adjustment tools, the spot removal, the adjustment brush, and the graduated filter. Preview. Over here on the right side, preview lets me see, let's say I make an adjustment to an image. So you just saw I drug the exposure way to the left and nothing happened on the image. If we look up here on our thumbnail, we see that that has gotten darker. The reason we don't see a change is I don't have preview checked. So it's a good way to go back and say, what did my original capture look like without those adjustments turning that preview on and off? We've already talked about our toggle full screen mode. Now let's talk about the tools going down the right side. We have a lot of sliders over here and then a lot of different menus that we can go through and, and look at. And when you first glance at it, you're like, oh man, do I have to know every single one of those? Am I going to have to touch all of those tools for every correction? And the answer is no. There's just some main ones to go to. And then there's other things that you can do to further your enhancement if you have a problem image or if you want to go to another, take it up another notch or two. So the first off, what we're going to talk about is the histogram value. This is giving us a histogram of the entire image. It's showing us that we've got some blacks that are blocked up by having it mashed up against the left side. And we've got a little bit of highlights that are overexposed because we've got this vertical line on the far right. We can also see warning tones by clicking on these two triangles in the upper corners. So when I click on this triangle on the left, it's showing me the areas that are blocked up in exposure or basically have no detail because they're underexposed. So I'm seeing that in the blue channel. If I adjust the exposure down, we can see those areas increase, and as, as I make further adjustments, I, I can tell that these areas are going to be a total black when I'm looking at the scene. Okay, same thing for the highlights. Where it comes in and right now it shows me red, that lets me know that those values are 255 or brighter. Now, some of you may have be familiar with other raw processing software that actually lets you go in and set a warning value to where that is going to start clipping. Unfortunately, you can't do that in Adobe Bridge. Um, it only clips at 255. One other thing to note is those values or the clipping values may change based on the color space that you're using. And we'll talk about setting up color space and those preferences down here in just another minute. So be aware of that. Okay, I can also see warning colors and tones by using a technique that's similar to what I have in Photoshop, 
pull down my Alt Option key, clicking on Exposure, and it shows me where that's going to clip out as well. And if I do the same thing for the blacks, I can see where it's going to clip out there. So that's another way to see clipping values without turning on those two warning values up there. Honestly, I don't turn those on very often. Um, just for me, it's a little distracting, but I, they, I do use them on occasion. I tend to use this uh, exposure slider with the Alt Option key held down a little bit more, um, especially if I'm teaching someone. I'll have those turned on, and as you get more comfortable doing it, then, then I end up turning them off, okay? So let's look next. We have a bunch of tabs coming across here. Um, we have, oh, let me back up for one more second. Um, right above that, you can see I've got my cursor over on our subject's face. I'm on the uh, color sampler tool. And you'll notice that now right underneath the histogram, I have RGB values. And as I hover or move the mouse around, it shows me what the RGB value is of that specific point, okay? The next information that I see up there is some EXIF data. I can see exposure information, the f-stop, the shutter speed, the ISO, and the lens information, which may be pertinent as I'm doing sharpening or noise reduction. Okay. Now, coming down under this, we have a bunch of different tabs. And I'm going to go through all the tabs first and just tell you what they do, and then we'll come back and work with uh, each one just a little bit. The basic tab is where you'll probably spend 99% of your time. This is where you're going to do white balance adjustments, color adjustments, where you're going to do your basic exposure adjustments, and possibly work with clarity, vibrance, and saturation. Our next over is our tone curve. Uh, in most of my workflow, I don't mess with the tone curve. It's there if I need to come in and, and tweak a curve. Um, it's just a different tool to use, and there's a couple different ways to use that. But again, I don't spend a whole lot of time on this tab. Our next one over is our sharpening and noise reduction tabs. And the default is 25, which is not a bad place to start. I find for me, um, if I'm shooting a Canon, this is a Canon 5D Mark II, that I tend to pull that sharpening up closer in the 50 to 75 range. Uh, I also shoot with an Nikon D3, and I pull that closer to the 60 to 75 range. So depending on the camera and your personal taste, you may want to adjust those sharpening values. Also, the noise reduction. Um, whenever you're doing the noise reduction and sharpening, it's recommended that you zoom in to 100%. Now, this is shot at ISO 1600, which is a fairly high ISO, um, but the Canon 5D Mark II does a pretty good job of uh, managing that, so it's not a bad ISO to shoot. I can come in and tone down the luminance or the, the noise ISO more if I want to by adjusting that. I can change if there was color noise. I can make adjustments there as well. So there's quite a bit of tools to work in here. Um, I've got some examples, and I don't have them where I can get to them to show you today. I, I did not load them up. But I have some examples of an image that I shot with a point-and-shoot camera at ISO 1600. And when I viewed that image with uh, Photoshop CS4 or earlier versions, the noise was unacceptable. I could not get rid of it using the raw processor. Um, and the image basically had to be thrown away. When I got CS5 and one of the, one of the big selling points of it, or one of the features that they were promoting, was the, the it handled camera raw noise significantly better. I went back and revisited that image and opened it up again, and it was a night and day difference how much better the noise reduction was in uh, camera raw in CS5. So don't be afraid to come in and use those tools. They do a really, really good job. This is one of the sections that when we set our preferences earlier to be specific to ISO or serial number, that it, it could be in, uh, important. So I'm going to come in and set a preference for these to show you how to do that. I'm going to bring up some noise reduction to tone that down a little bit. I'm just going to adjust this to get the look I'm going for on this. And then come over here on the detail tab. There's a little drop-down menu on the right side. 
And from here, I can choose to save this as a camera raw default. So anytime I open up a 5D Mark II image that's at an ISO of 1600, it's going to automatically apply this amount of sharpening and this amount of noise reduction. So I'll never have to remember to do that again. Okay, our next tab over is our HSL grayscale. This is, I use this for two different things. One, I can come in and convert an image to black and white in one click just by applying that grayscale conversion. The other nice thing that I can do is if I like a specific tone or look of grayscale, I can do that by adjusting each of these channels like a channel mixer. So you can see as I adjust the reds, if you look at her, her skin tone and her lips, in this case, I've lightened them up quite a bit. I can go and darken down the reds now and see uh, it's darkened and make her, made her skin a lot blotchier. I can come in and do the same thing. For example, I can darken down the greens, which is going to darken down the background. Notice if I go too far on that, see that blotchiness? Let me zoom up on this a little bit. So you can see I'm getting a kind of a blotchy hard edge look and that will show up in my print. So keep in mind that you don't want to go really extreme on some of those conversions. Um, and you may have to work around uh, what you've got to kind of get the look that you're going for. But the default or auto settings on that black and white conversion is a good place to start. This is also handy if I want to come in and adjust specific tones in an image. And we'll grab an image to do that later on and work with this one in a little bit more detail. So I can adjust the hue, saturation, and luminance when I'm not on the grayscale. So hue is going to adjust the tone so I can make my greens go to a darker green or more to a blue green or to a yellow green, depending on what I want to do. Uh, I've seen uh, some of the older Canon cameras, uh, if you or even with an icon, if you photograph and have your subject kind of backlit and there's a lot of grass back there, it kind of gets that yellowish tinge to it. Uh, you can come in and tweak the green and make it get a little bit more blue and maybe take care of some of those issues. Um, keep in mind, whenever you're adjusting reds, you're going to also be adjusting the skin tone. So be real cautious that when you're adjusting reds and oranges not to affect the skin tone coming in there. So let's reset all those back. So saturation will take a specific tone and make it more saturated. So we'll resaturate the greens or desaturated so we can make them go to a more uh, monochromatic. And luminance just changes the density. We can make the greens go really dark or we can lighten it up quite a bit. Okay, so that's the HSL tab. Split toning. I use split toning in conjunction with HSL, and where I use this one is if I want a, a, a colored black and white image. So for example, I might like a, a blue toned black and white. So I'm going to come to my shadows, adjust that into the blue value, and then bring up the saturation for that. So we can see now I have a blue tone. If I want to have that as a sepia, just grab the hue, drag it over into the red-yellow range until you get the sepia values that you want. Another way to do this is I did that with shadows. You can also come in and do the same thing with the highlights. So let's go back to the blues. And you see in this case, I'm making the highlight values pick up more blue. So if you really want to see the difference here, I'm going to make my shadows go yellow. So we can see the shadow areas have a yellow tinge to them, and the highlight areas have a blue tinge to it. So I can get a kind of a cross-process look, which is kind of freaky if you ask me, but some people like it. So we'll just reset those again. And to save this, like we did earlier, I'm going to come in and go to a sepia look. And this is a two-part conversion. One is I have to convert to grayscale first and then set my split toning. And then I can come in and save this, not as a default, but as a setting. So I'm going to save this, and the only settings that I want to save, I'm going to do a custom subset. Actually, I'm going to turn off a bunch of things. The only things that I want to save for this 
we'll get down here, is the grayscale conversion and the split toning. We don't want to turn any of these other ones on. And we'll go through these again as well. So I'm going to press Save. And I'm going to call this Sepia Brown. So now I have saved that setting, and we'll show you how to use that again a little bit later on. Our next is for lens corrections, and we'll go and look at some images and do lens corrections with that. Next is effects. With effects, I can come in and add grain. So we went through first and removed noise, but now if we want, don't want that real smooth look, I can come back in and start adding grain on the image, change the look of it, change the size of it, how smooth or rough it is. And again, it, it can add some texture back into my image, uh, depending on what I'm looking to accomplish. So that's another effect tool that we can come in and apply. So that's without the grain. Again, that could be saved as a preset. We'll zoom back out all the way here. I can also come in and do vignetting, and this is called a post-crop vignette. Let me show you the difference between there. We have lens corrections, and this gives us a vignette that is overall on the image. So I'm going to apply it pretty strong. So we have a vignette that's covering the edges. We can go either to the highlights or the shadows. So you can see it's applying a, a slight vignette going across that image. But if I come in and crop on the image, that vignette is not applied to the crop area because this is applying for this specific lens. You'll see that there are lens profiles. It knows I'm working with a Canon. This was with the, the 70 to 200 to 8 lens, and it is using an Adobe profile. And there's ways to set up profiles, and there's lots of information on that on the Adobe website. We can also come in and uh, correct for distortion or chromatic aberrations, um, which we're not going to go through and talk about in this class. We can also see we can do transformations. I can distort the image specific ways here if I want to manually adjust for a distortion. Um, and I can manually do a lot of different things in here. Also, here's where I can do some additional lens vignetting. So we'll over accentuate so you can see that. Let me bring the midpoint this way. There you go. And again, as I crop, it doesn't apply the vignette to that cropped area. When we're on the effects tab, let me make sure I reset all this. When I'm on the effects tab, when I apply a vignette, we're going to make a pretty heavy vignette coming in, and I crop in on the image, we'll see that a vignette is applied to the cropped area. So this post-crop vignette means it's going to apply the vignette to the area that we've cropped to. And I can make quite a bit of adjustments here. I've seen some people come in with the vignette and make it go fairly square. They've turned the feather down. And they basically can make an edge effect on the vignette. So here we've got a, a circle. Go the other direction. And you can see I've kind of got like a, a, an edge going around that. And if I change the amount to the right, it kind of gives me a white border going around on that. So you can get some neat effects by playing with that vignette option, supposed to crop vignette. Okay. Next over is camera calibration. And uh, two things to mention on this. One, uh, you do have different camera profiles that you can work with. So let me reset this back to a color image. And if I come in, for example, camera portrait, it's going to bump up the skin tones just a little bit and go to a neutral. Um, that's really just all based on preference. One of the things that I use that I don't have any in here is I often use the um, x uh Color Checker Passport and can build my own color profiles depending on what I'm shooting. And it does a really good job as well. And this is where you would see those loaded up in here. I caution people, I wouldn't just come in and, and randomly start messing with these 
um, profile selectors unless you really know what you're doing. I've had customers that have, by messing with them, have really ended up having a lot of color issues that, that took a while to diagnose why the colors weren't coming out the way they were expected. So be cautious in moving through these and do a lot of testing. The other thing to notice, you'll see that you have two different processes in here. You have a 2010 and a 2003. The 2010 is the new algorithms that Adobe came up with when they started uh, talking about CS5. And that's where you get the better sharpening techniques, the better noise reduction techniques. If you use the 2003 techniques, you're going to see two things happen. One, if you've got an image that has a lot of noise in it, you'll see that noise becomes more predominant when you're using the 2003 look. So here we'll switch back and forth. There's 2003. And there goes to the 2010. And, and we're seeing subtle differences in here. This is not a great example to see that. I should, if I had some other images, I, and especially point and shoot camera images, you'll see huge differences on that. The other thing to notice, when you're on the 2003 process, you'll see this little exclamation point down here in the lower right-hand corner. That lets you know you're using the older process, and by clicking on it, it will upgrade you. Why would you use the 2003 process? Well, if you've got some art pieces that you've done in the past uh, that you need to recreate and you need to keep the same look and feel, you might want to use that 2003 look to keep the same look going across. Honestly, everything that I do, I just upgrade to the 2010. Our next icon over is to show presets. Remember, we created a preset earlier called Sepia Brown. All I have to do now is click on that, and I'm back to that same look. So I can see that in there very easily. And the last thing are snapshots. Snapshots are kind of like a history, but you physically have to make a snapshot, and it will save that in on your workflow. So for example, let's say I want to keep that sepia brown. So I come to snapshots, and I create a new snapshot down here at the bottom of the screen. There's a new page icon, and I can give this a name. But then I also want to keep this image in color. So I'll reset or take off those adjustments, come back to my snapshots, and make a new one and call it color. So I can alternate between those two looks fairly easily. OK. So that is just a real quick overview through all of those tools. Now let's look at actually making some corrections and batch correcting images, now that we kind of know what we're going to go through. The one tool we haven't talked about is the basic, and we'll talk about it as we make these corrections. OK, I'm going to pause for just a quick second. OK, before we get into these main corrections, uh, I'm going to come back to our main controller here, our main screen, and just pause for a second and see if anybody has any questions uh, over any of the things that we've talked about so far. And just as a reminder, we are recording today's class, and you'll be able to go back and review this uh, usually in a couple days after the class. So if you have a question, you can do two things. One. You'll see a little raise your hand icon on the right side underneath participants, or you can just type a message into the chat dialog down at the bottom. OK. Not seeing any come up right now, so we're going to go back to share my desktop. And don't forget that there is that control panel up at the top that you can click on to bring down to, uh, if you've got questions, uh, you can type those into there. And I, I am watching that as we go through today's class. OK, fixing images, what we're all here for. First thing that I want to do is select the image with a gray card or a known color value in it. Um, for me, especially when I'm teaching someone to do camera raw, I really uh, like talking about or, or encourage them to use some type of target image, whether it's uh, like this Luma, this pop-up gray target, whether it's an H&H &H Zebra card, whether it is using 
the, the I-1 passport system. Um, there's all sorts of tools for doing that, but use one of them because it will help in your consistency. So the first thing that I do is grab my color picker and click on that gray. That adjusts the color balance on that image. Like we said earlier, as you click around on it, you can see it's changing. One of the things to mention about this, whenever I click on gray, it is making neutral color. Neutral color isn't always pleasing color. When people like and look at a print and they say, oh, that has good, rich colors, they don't always mean that that color is realistic. It just means that that image has pretty color in it. It may be more saturated. The cover colors may be more vibrant, but they're not necessarily realistic. To get to that point, let's start with good color or neutral color by clicking on that gray. If you are working on a good calibrated monitor, you can go to this next step and adjust the white balance, the temp temperature and tint by eye. If you're having H and H color correct, we're going to always color correct for pretty color. We're not going to always color correct for accurate color, meaning we're going to try to make the skin tones a little bit warmer, a little bit richer, uh, and, and make the image itself look really good. So by clicking on the gray to start off with gets me to that neutral. And then I can come over here on the temperature and tint sliders and tweak them. So if I want to have an image that's a little bit warmer, I'm going to slide up the temperature towards the yellow, maybe add a little bit more magenta to it. If I want to be a little bit cooler, I'm going to slide the temperature down to the blue side and, and or take the tint into the greens. I can always reset that by just clicking on the gray. Next is to start adjusting exposure. So I have some numbers that I kind of call my magic numbers that uh, I'll use, especially when I'm on a monitor that I don't know how accurately it's calibrated or the characteristics of that. I know, for example, that when, I, when we get an image at H&H &H to print, if I expect to see detail in the highlights of the skin tone or the specular highlight area, so for example, on this image, I'm going to zoom up on it. Zoom up a little bit too far. If I want to see detail up here in her forehead, in some of those areas on her cheek, I don't want those values to be brighter than 240. And that's for the red channel. So here's how I can find out where those bright out values are. First off, by turning on that warning value, that highlight clipping, I can see these are values that are brighter than 255. So I'm going to grab my color picker tool and kind of go to this one here on her <coughs> nose, uh, or uh, up here on the bridge of her nose. I'm going to put another one on, the, on her cheek. And as I lower my exposure slider, that's going to turn down the highlights. And I'm going to, as I turn that down, I'm looking for where does that red go away last? So in, that, in this case, it's down here on our cheek. So I'm going to move that color picker down into that value because that's the brightest part of her face. Okay. So what I'm doing is finding the brightest part of her face by turning on the color or the warning values first. And then as I lower that, trying to find what's the last spot that goes red or goes away from red, which is in this case color picker number two. I'm just going to get rid of color picker one, snip it off by holding down the Alt key. And now as I lower my exposure, I'm going to watch this RGB value up here on the top of my screen. And I'm going to lower the exposure to get that value between 235 and 240. So we've been looking at this image for quite a while, and it is starting to look a little underexposed because we got used to it looking so bright. So I brought that tone down. Now I can also come in and look for values on my blacks. So I'm going to come in, and as I move my cursor around, and I'm on that color sampler tool, remember I can look at my RGB values up under the histogram, and I'm going to look for values where I want to have detail. Now uh, there's two ways I'm going to show this to you. The first is I'm going to come in, and if I expect to see detail in those areas of the blacks, I may need to adjust my fill light, and I want my values to be 10 to 15 or higher to print with detail. 
So example spot number two, I'm seeing 17, 15, 13. I should see some detail in there. Spot number three is probably going to go pretty black back in there. So I can use fill light to adjust that. I can also come in and use the black value and lower it to bring that up as well. So if I'm expecting to see detail in those blacks, I want to make sure those values are brighter than 15. Now, another way to do this, and this is often what I'll do, I'll start off with leave the fill light at the neutral. If I hold down the Alt Option key, I can start to see where those blacks are going to clip. Now, I like to, just for me, for contrast, I like to see just a little bit of black show up in the eye. So we'll zoom up here on her face. And if we hold down our Alt Option key, we bring that up to right where I'm going to get a little bit in her eye. And I was getting right some right along there on the edge. Now, in doing that, I can see in this case, I've totally blocked up her sweater in there. So I'm going to add some fill light to bring some detail back in that. One of the things that I have seen with the Canon camera is I don't typically bring the blacks up very high. I, a lot of times, even if it's not clipping, leave it down there in the, in the 5 to 7, maybe the 10 range, and then adjust the fill light as I need to come in. This will also vary based on the image and the ISO, so there's not a hard and fast number for where I end up putting those blacks. Because I do most of my adjustments with, with exposure, recovery, fill light, and blacks, I do very little with brightness and contrast. I find that I can get what I'm going for by just using those four sliders. What the recovery slider does is brings information back in highlights that may be lost by adjusting the exposure slider. In this case, we're not going to see any effect on it because we've darkened down the exposure. It does do a little bit by bringing some detail back up here in the, the specular highlights in her, above her head, but it's not going to make a dramatic recovery. Keep in mind that the recovery slider is not going to bring back highlights that were overexposed to begin with. There had to be detail there to start with. This is really handy uh, if you've got somebody wearing a white shirt that uh, you've got the shirt exposed properly, but his skin was a little bit underexposed. And as you bring the exposure up to make his skin correct, if you lose detail in his white shirt, the recovery slider will help bring that in very easily. OK. The next three sliders, clarity, vibrance, and saturation. Clarity adds a kind of a sharpening, uh, and, and it's more specifically an edge sharpening on the image. And as we come in and drag that to the right, we can see it's going to pump up uh, maybe some of the detail in her hair. So as I slide that to the left, we can see everything kind of gets a, a haze over it, so to speak. Her skin is getting smoother, but we've lost some detail going through there. If we take it really extreme to the right, uh, we start. it increases edge contrast in there. It looks a little grittier. Um, so that's, that's really what the clarity does. In general, I like adding a little bit of clarity to everything. Now, vibrance. Vibrance is a kind of a smart form of saturation. Everybody knows that if you grab the saturation slider and move it to the right, you can end up with a really orange looking person very quickly. If I wanted to just add some color back here into the background, saturation does it, but it really can mess up my skin tone. What vibrance does is moves I've heard this explained a couple different ways. The way I explain it, what makes sense to me, it tends to move the cooler tones in your image faster. So the blues, the greens, um, the, the cooler tones, they move faster when you do vibrance. And it doesn't tend to adjust warmer tones like skin tones. So you can see if I wanted that, uh, if I want to bring the, some pop out in that background in the greens, just using the vibrance slider brings that up pretty nicely. OK? So that's, I've got this adjust, image adjusted um, kind of the way I like it. Now I have a bunch of other images. So is my solution to come in, grab this image, and start trying to remember where I placed all the sliders? No, I'm not going to do that. That's too much work. So what I'm going to do is start by selecting that first image, and then press Select All or Control A to select the rest of the images in that shoot, in that session. And then just press the Synchronize button. 
and I want to synchronize all of the settings that I have done on here. So I've made white balance, exposure, recovery, any of these settings that I've done, I'm going to synchronize and say OK, and it will go through and apply those. Now it did those very quickly, so you can see it's already rendered them out. Something to keep in mind when you're looking at these images, notice that, let me go to the next one, that orange or the yellow uh, warning triangle. When that shows up there, that's just letting you know that Bridge and Camera Raw have not built a full preview yet, so give it a second to process. The image will get sharper. Now, you'll notice as I was going through those, up until I hit this image, they were all really consistent. From this image on, the photographer moved to a slightly different location, and now this has a yellower look to it, and I might want to make them blend a little bit better, so I'm just going to add some blue. This time I just selected the images all together and then adjust the slide, adjusted the slider and it batch corrected them simultaneously. I'm going to say that done now and when we jump back into bridge, we'll see it's going to go through and it, this may keep up on your screen and it's adjusting each one of those images and toning down the exposure very quickly. I can tell that adjustments have been made because I have this little circle with the arrows on it that lets me know that there is an adjustment made to that image. Okay, let's jump ahead for a second, and I'm going to show you something, and I'm going to reveal in Finder, which basically is where I'm seeing all of these files. Let's make this a little bit smaller. Oops, clicked on the wrong button. Okay, looking in here now, you're going to see with each of the images we've adjusted that I have a file, and I have this XMP file. This XMP file, remember earlier when we were in preferences, we said save corrections in Camera Raw database or in XMP. I save them in XMP because I can move these to other locations if I need to. What this is going to do, for example, let's go into this very first image, and let's take this and make it really dark. So we see now in Bridge, that file has gotten really dark. If I come into where my files are and take the XMP file that is associated with that file and delete it, when I come back into Bridge, it has just reset those, that file to the way it was shot. I can come back and grab that XMP file out of the trash. No, and I had a bunch in there, so I'm not going to do that. But I could drag it back into this folder, and that correction would take place again. So um, let's come back in here. We'll do this one more time. And we'll just drag that to the desktop. And it kept track of where I put it, so that's not going to work. Anyway, oh, I know why it didn't work. So it's on my desktop. I'm going to delete it now. There we go. Now it has changed in here. If I drag that file back in, it will update it. That's the recipe file that tells Camera Raw how to adjust the file. Now, if I want to set this one back to match all the others, I just open up two files at the same time. I'm going to grab this second image, which is corrected, select all, and then synchronize and it will take this one back to the way it was processed earlier. Okay, um, any questions on the basic corrections? I talked through that and it takes a lot longer to talk through and explain than to actually do. Let me go into another set of images here and go through correcting them. So I've got a large selection this time and I'm gonna walk through these a little faster and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna tell you what I'm doing but I won't give as much detail. For this one, I'm going to start by pressing Select All and then Click Balancing. So you can watch the thumbnails on the left as I click around. They all are getting updated as I click on, on their image. So I'm going to make that image go to Neutral. I'm going to turn on my warning colors, put a color sampler down on her cheek, and adjust that down to get the exposure where it should be numerically. I'm going to use my Alt or Option key to see kind of where my blacks are clipping. 
I'm going to bring that up just a little bit higher. Get some contrast in there. And then what I'll do is uh, I can also keep those selected. Add just a little bit of clarity and vibrance going through there. And then I'll just click on each image and go through and say, hey, how, how accurate, how consistent was I on those? Is everything staying tight? Well, we moved here just a little bit. That one looks a little bit brighter, so I'm going to tone it down. And as you do this more and more by eye or, or by the numbers, you'll start knowing what a good density should look like going through there. Okay? I'm going to say done on that set. And we'll see they'll all get updated here in Camera Raw. Grab the next set of images. This is a set that in looking at them, we can tell, whoa, those are way overexposed. Again, press Select All, click Balance, and start working on the exposure to bring that in. Get that down where I want it to be. In this case, I'm still losing um, detail in her skirt, because if we look at this image real closely, the exposure up here on her face is quite a bit different. There's some light fall off as we go lower. So how can I fix that? Well, I can't come and drop the exposure low enough to bring everything back into her skirt because then her skin is too light. So how else could I do that? Well, this is a great example for another tool. We can come into our gradiated, graduated filter. And what this does is we click and drag. We're making a graduated filter. So I can go from red to green. So I'm going to keep red up here, drag the green down further. And the more I pull this apart, the, the smoother the transition is. And I can adjust my exposure slider up here. I'm going to turn the warning color off and kind of blend in. In this case, we're getting some her that those yellows were so overexposed that uh, we're going to have some problems with this. But we can start to blend in this exposure just a little bit better. I'm going to slide it down a little bit more. So the red is keeping what we had before, and the green is what the adjustment is adjusting in. So I could come in and darken that down, pull a little bit of saturation out of it maybe. This one we're just going to get some weird stuff on because it is so extreme. But you can see by adjusting that exposure and saturation down, we've evened out the exposure a little bit on that scene. You can see it across the gray card now. I'm going to make these really close together and accentuate that difference so you can see really what's going on. So there, you can see the red is where we were and green is what we're adjusting to. And there's a real narrow band as we go across that. Okay? So we're going to spread that out a little bit more, bring that down, and don't lower the exposure quite so much. And you can see I can also come in and rotate that, so left, right, up, and down, however the light is coming across the scene. Tweak that in. Okay? Now, because I've applied that on that first image, I've made some additional adjustments. When I synchronize these, I can also tell it to synchronize um, those types of local adjustments that I've done, which is that graduated filter. And it will apply that across all of these images. Now I can look at the image and come in and grab it and say, wait, that's a little bit too high. Let's pull that down just a little bit more. So I can move that around without having to do as much work. So there's a great tool use of the uh, graduated filter. And say done on that. We'll see those get applied. Let's jump down here and do this next set. Do the same thing. We'll do a select all. Do our white balance. We're gonna, I'm going to use the Alt Option key this time on skin tones. And kind of tweak down to get that where that needs to be. Okay. Now on this one, we're going to use a slightly different tool to show some different effects. We'll come into the second image here. And let's say we want to do a vignette on this, but we don't want to do a circle vignette. We want to do a custom vignette. So on this one, I'm going to come in and go to my adjustment brush, which shortcut key is K. 
You'll see that brings up an adjustment brush value. I'm going to reset this and just turn down the exposure a little bit. I can tell it's auto mask or not, which I'm not going to. But as I come in and brush, I can paint in a vignette on this area. I can adjust the brush size. The area between the hard circle and the dotted line is my feather area. So remember, if I use this preview button, I can see a before and after. So there I just brought in a vignette by brushing in. If I hover over that little green dot, that shows me the area the vignette's being applied to. I can also come in and erase it. So I've got a little too much on her face. So I can erase some of that vignette back off and then hover over it again to see how it's applied. If I turn Show Mask on, that will do that as well. And I'm going to set that to a red color so it's a little bit easier to see. So that's an easy way to come in and use that adjustment brush. I can also use it to do other types of enhancements. If I scroll up here, zoom up, and I have seen people come in and use, uh, I'm going to add a new point. I'm going to set the exposure back to zero. And I'm going to take the clarity and slide it down a little bit. And I'm just going to paint over her skin. And that gives me a real quick skin softening brush that I can use to just to do if I was doing previews or I just want to smooth the skin out real quick for, for something. I can use that to come in and, and do that as a very, very quick and dirty retouch brush, um, which can be very handy. I can also use that to change saturation or any of these types of things. So I use that tool quite frequently as well to, to spot adjust areas on my image that need more help than a global correction. That also could be done to come in and add a new point. In this one, I'm going to say auto mask. Oops, I messed up there. Let's select that point again and to bring the exposure back up. We're going to go to a new, click. So there's uh, my new point. It's going to adjust. In this case, I've got auto mask turned on. So wherever I paint, I'm going to bring down exposure. As long as it stays within that black circle, it's going to only adjust that area. You can see I'm darkening down her skirt, but it's not going in and adjusting into her skin tone there because of the contrast dif difference. So if I can come in and take her skirt, bring the exposure way up bring it way down, and you can see it didn't go out into her skin area by turning on that auto mask. It's just affecting her skirt on that. So that's another great tool to use is using that auto mask if you're trying to adjust a specific area. If you've got sky that you want to darken up, you can use that auto mask and select that sky color. So we can see now I've got three different pins on this image. I've got one that's doing the skin. I've got one that's doing her skirt, and I've got a third one that's adjusting the vignette for the background. I can turn those pins on or off to see them, and I can also clear all of them as well. Okay? So we'll say done on that. So I've taken you through a lot of the main tools for adjusting images. Now let's talk about how to take these images and convert them out to get JPEGs or PSDs or TIFFs. There are three different ways to do this. And they all have pros and cons. So we're going to come back up to the beginning and we'll, we're going to talk about each one. The first one is just by pressing Control R, being in camera raw, we can say open image. When I do that, you can see Adobe Bridge is now bouncing in my dock. It's actually going out and opening up Photoshop for me. I'm sorry, Adobe Photoshop is bouncing in my dock. And Photoshop is now saying, or Bridge is saying, hey, Photoshop, you need to open. And I want you to open up that raw file that I just was working on with the corrections I just did. So we see we've got our progress circle going. And there's our raw file. So now we're in Photoshop. We can start retouching this, enhancing it. And when we're done, we can save this out as a new JPEG or a Photoshop document, whatever we want to go to. So I'm going to save, uh, save this to my desktop, set my sliders here. OK. So as, if we did that, and again, think back into a wedding environment where we have hundreds of hundreds of images, 
that would take quite a while to go through and say, okay, I'm going to open this one, double click it, open it into raw, say open image, bring up Photoshop, wait, wait, open in Photoshop, save that file out as a new JPEG, say save, and move on. It's going to take quite a while to go through. So not the most efficient way to do that. The second way to do this, grab a series of images. So let's say I've corrected these. I can come up here to Tools, to Photoshop, and come to Image Processor. Now when I open up the Image Processor, it's going to open up this dialog inside of Photoshop. I can tell it where to save it. I can say either in a new folder or the same location. I often use same location on this one. I can tell what type of file I want to save this as, a JPEG, a Photoshop document, or a TIFF. I'm going to save these as a JPEG quality 12. If I wanted to run an action on them, I could. I'm not going to. And I'm going to say run. What this is going to do is open up each one of those images into Photoshop save it and close it into that location that I saved. So you can see, while this doesn't take me any longer, it's not really fast. It's the next fastest way to do this, but it's not incredibly fast. I have to wait through every image to go through. Okay? And I probably shouldn't have selected that many images, but that's okay. We'll go in and do the third way. So we're going to jump back into Bridge while it's working. I'm going to point out that that did create a JPEG folder for me. Oops, clicked on the wrong thing. And if I open up that JPEG folder, I can see those files get saved in, in there as we go. Okay, let me see if I can get that to stop. No, I think I have to let that run. Okay, so. That's the second way to process those out. The third way is to grab the same bunch of images. There we go. I forced it to quit. Okay. Third way is to grab that same bunch of images. And I'm going to just go delete the ones that we just did because I'm going to use that folder again. Bring them into Camera Raw. Oops. Select all, and this time I'm going to press this Save Image dialog. This lets me specify where I'm going to save them. It will not create a new folder like the image processor will. So I'm going to save in new location. I can then browse to where I want to save it. So I could create a new folder. So I'm going to make a new one and call this Process from Raw. It's been selected and choose select on it. I can choose to rename these files. I can specify the file formats here. I can press save. And we'll see now that I get a little hyperlink in the bottom left. If I click on that, I can see that it's processing out those 15 files. I can press OK to let it process and say done. While it's processing, I can grab another set of images. So let's grab through that next set that we corrected bring them into RAW, select all, press save images. It's going to remember where I set those last ones in the criteria and press save. So now I've got 34 images in my queue, you know, 33. It's processing through those. So we can see those going through here. Say OK, say done. And I could continue so on and so forth. If I come back up here, what's nice about this, if I go into that process by RAW file, I can see those images showing up in there as it's saving them out. I can also open one of those images up into Photoshop. So I'm now inside of Photoshop. And I can come in and start retouching that. So I'm not going to actually do some retouching, but just to show you, oops. I could come in and I'm going to paint some color on this. Let's grab another color. Put some white on there. Let's go and grab another color. And we'll write my name. 
really big brush so you can't read it. So I'm doing all sorts of retouching to that image. I can save it now, close it, and when I jump back into Bridge, I can see those updates have taken place, and Bridge is still processing out raw files for me. So I can be working on two things at once while it's processing those in the background. I can keep working on other images. So that's the way that I do most of my raw processing is doing it as a save from Bridge so that I can continue working in Photoshop at the same time. I can go back and correct other images. Okay, have a couple more things to go over. We're getting near the end of today's class. Thanks for hanging in there. This is really one of the longer classes that we teach just because there's a lot of detail going through that. A couple things that I skipped over on my notes that I said I needed to talk to you about. Um, let me grab an image, bring it into Camera Raw. I did not talk about these hyperlinks down at the bottom of the screen, so let's go through those real quick. This hyperlink brings up workflow options where you can set color space that you want to work in. I had mentioned earlier that depending on what color space you had will determine where those color values clip. And for H&H, &H, we recommend you can work in either the sRGB color space or in the Adobe 1998 color space. So you can choose either one of those. For most instances, I'm going to work in an 8-bit per channel color bit depth. Um, in some, and this is when I'm converting the file out, in some instances, I might do that as 16-bit, but for most cases, I go to 8-bit. If I have an image that I need to do additional dodging, burning, um, color adjustments to in Photoshop after Camera Raw, that's when I'm going to consider going to a 16-bit file. Okay? Size. The size is going to come in, um, and you'll notice that you have different options. You have a minus one that has no line on it, and then pluses. Um, if you're shooting with, um, say, a Fuji or a Nikon D1X, you might see some other icons in there. Basically, if it does not have a plus or minus on it, that's the native resolution of your RAW file from your camera. If there's a plus on it, that means Photoshop or Adobe Camera Raw is going to interpolate up information from your image. If there's a minus on it, it's going to throw away information and give you a smaller file. So there are cases where you need to go larger or smaller. Photoshop does a really good job of doubling the amount of information in your file with very little or no quality loss. So I never have a problem with bumping that up a size or two if I need to. Resolution can be set to whatever is appropriate for your output. You can do 240, you can do 300. And then I typically, uh, you can also specify sharpening uh, options on there. Uh, ha however you want to add that beyond what sharpening is applied to the image. You can also say to open the object or open the image in Photoshop as a smart object, which can be handy as well. We're not going to go into that type of workflow today. So keep in mind that you want to check those options down below uh, when you're working on your files to make sure you have everything set the way you need it to. Okay? I'll just press cancel on that. And while we were working on that, all the files that we chose to render out are now saved into that working folder. So it processed out about 39 files as we were sitting there going through stuff in just a matter of minutes. So it's a very fast way to process. Okay? Let's talk about a couple other things that I did not go over. One is we talked about making the preset earlier. Remember, we made a um, sepia preset. I can apply that in Bridge by selecting a range of images, right-clicking, and coming down to Develop Settings. And you'll see right now it lists that sepia brown. If I choose that, that's going to convert all those images into that brown tone that we made earlier. Okay, really handy. Another way to do that, let's grab another image. Let's come in on this image and convert it to just a straight black and white. Let's darken the greens and the yellows a little bit. I'm going to highlight, bring up the reds and yellows to lighten the skin tone. I'm sorry, the reds and oranges. And we'll bring down the blues so we can start mimicking different types of filters. 
Let's also apply a post crop vignette to it. Darken that down, bring the midpoint in. So now I'm going to save a new preset. And I'm going to save this one. The only things that I need to save on this, I can uncheck a lot of things. Come on, there we go. I want to save the grayscale conversion and the post crop vignetting. I might save grain on that if I apply it. I'm going to press save and I'm going to call this black and white. Vignette. So I'm going to say done. Now when I go to an image and right click, go to develop settings, you'll see I'll have that black and white vignette that will automatically apply that to the images as well. So I can develop presets that I can just right click and apply across a bunch of images. I can also reset that and go to the previous conversion or come in develop settings and just say clear settings. A third thing that I can do is if I want to take that back where it was before, this image was processed the same. So I can go to Develop Settings, Copy, come to this one, Develop Settings, and Paste to set the specific settings back the way it was before. So it gives me an easy way to go through and see how those adjustments are being made. So I'll use those presets quite a bit to go through and, and set things. Um, to get different looks that I want to go, go with. Okay, let's just jump back to our main screen here. And I promised you a document that I would give to you at the end of today's class. So let me pull that up for you. And there is a PDF now that is showing up on a file transfer window. So you should be able to click on that and just choose the download option. This PDF will kind of walk you through uh, the steps that I go through and in the order that I do it for adjusting an image. If you are watching today's class uh, at a later date when it's been recorded, um, just drop me an email and I'd be happy to send this PDF to you. Okay, that pretty much brings us to the end of today's class. I'm going to hang out in the room for a couple minutes, so if you guys do have questions, feel free to raise your hand or type a question into the chat dialog, and I will do my best to answer those questions for you. As always, from everybody here at H&H &H Color Lab, thanks for attending today's class. Uh, we really appreciate your business as a photographer and hope to see you in a web class real soon. Have a great week, and like I said, I'll be hanging out here answering questions for a little bit, and um, if you don't have any questions and you've got the PDF downloaded, um, you're, you're more than welcome to take off. Have a great day.